So welcome to today's webinar residence series in Plants 101. It is being presented by our very own Tremaine Watkins, CDT. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce the Adam Dreyfus, Director of University, Government and Institutions. Take it away, Adam. As I always say, thank you. Thank you so much for your support, your partnership. As I always say, and I truly do believe it, we're here for you today, tomorrow, and for the future. And you are investing in your future right now by sitting and listening to these presentations. Also, as I have brought up to you, these presentations are for you. So please get involved, ask your questions, ask us for other information, whatever you want to learn about, we are here to support you and we will do our best to bring it forth. But it's enough about what I can speak about right now. I will definitely hear you at the end of this presentation, but I have to turn it over to our living encyclopedia, the man, the myth, the legend, Tremaine Watkins. Take it away on the topic of Implants 101, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adam and Jessica. I really appreciate it. Yeah, these guys build the framework and I come in every once in a while as, as the help. So if you guys enjoy these programs, it's they put so much work in behind the scenes. So great work by you guys. Um, today, we're going to be talking about Implants 101. I try to review this before I do the presentation just to be current. So it's not like I, I mean, anybody can read a slide deck. So hopefully it's more than that. And I realized there's a lot of material, so I need to kind of fly on this. So I even left out some stuff I think is fun. I'll uh, I'll, I'll hit it briefly as we're going along. So uh, presenter disclosure, I'm a full-time employee of National Ventex Corporation. And of course I've been paid to do this presentation. Um, there's no other commercial support. So no other vendors or anything like that have provided financial support. I'm sharing what I believe is uh, helpful information for you guys. So let's dive in. You know, we're going to do a basic overview of osseointegrated implants. As you guys know from your education, this is a huge, huge topic. But what I want to kind of talk about is like the basics. Just go back over it one more time. If anybody has any questions, we're going along. Why even talk about it? So the American College of Prosthodontists estimates that there are 120 million people in the U.S. missing at, one, at least one tooth. And that's expected to grow to 200 million over the next 15 years. Of the current people, so we got 120 million, 15 million have had a bridge, and 3 million have implants. So that means there's 100 million people that are candidates for a single tooth implant. And by the way, the edentulous population is about 30 to 35 million. So that's another on top of this. As you guys know, periodontal disease is the main culprit. The loss is 70% of teeth. Um, some patients, as you know, it's systemic causes, but poor hygiene is a large factor. So putting all that together, uh, patients getting more involved with you guys with hygiene will give them more teeth over a longer period of time. Uh, rampant decay and parafunction, trauma, cancer, wear, and uh, behavioral problems such as sugary diets and smoking, as you know, also lead to tooth loss. That's how a person gets in this situation. This is a slide. I have a lot on this, um, but we need to skip through it to keep going. But it's interesting that if you go back, we have cases that are 5,000 years old of people having implants. So it's interesting that all throughout human history, it's been well known, perhaps more than today, that, that having a full set of teeth is so advantageous to your health. Um, I'm going to skip through a lot of this. Um, the right-hand image is a Chinese bamboo implant uh, that we found. Um, on the left, we have what's called a blade implant, and you may still see some of these in your practice. Um, these were done in the 60s. Dr. Lenko uh, figured these out, and at the time, they were, you know, an incision was made, and they were hammered into the bone. They were thought to be... Um, retained by mechanical processes, but now we know that they're also osseointegrated. The main thing is that this component, uh, the super gingival component on these is um, usually hand formed. And so the best you could do is take an iOS or an impression of it and have your laboratory make something that's adapted directly to it. Uh, 
For those of you who don't know, Dr. Per Ingevar Brandemark, the founder of Noble BioCare, uh, discovered osseointegration in studies of rabbit femurs in the 50s. He uh, introduced the first modern implant, I guess you could say, in 1978, and he also developed zygomatic implants in the 90s. So uh, modern dental implants, all of them are directly to sit from Dr. Brandemark's design. So, you know, you guys have spent a lot of time studying teeth and you know how complex they are. But I think if we think about it too, from a functional perspective, it really has three important elements. It has the crown of the tooth, which is the aesthetic and functional part. You don't have that, obviously you can't do anything with the tooth, but it also has the attachment. And if the tooth doesn't have any attachment, it becomes a necklace. So you need to have both. And then the rest of the tooth serves to keep it alive and to connect the two parts. So one of the advantages of an osseointegrated implant is it replaces all three of these. It has a crown or a, a large restoration or whatever that serves for aesthetic and function, very similar to a natural tooth. It has the implant itself, which provides solid attachment to the bone um, through osseointegration. And it has an abutment that links the two together. If you look at everything that we had back in the 80s, when I first got started in this field, um, we didn't really have, um, osseointegrated implants in the US really started being a factor in the, uh, I'd say the early, at least for me, the early to mid 90s. Um, and so we had to give people's dentures and partials but if they were missing a lot of teeth. And as you know, the stinky thing about those is that they move around when you chew and when you talk. So the stability of an implant is a major advantage. Even with bridges, you know, if you think about your bridge patients that you've worked with, their main concern is that they get food impaction under the ponic because it's not connected. So I think most people would agree that the, not everyone will do it, but the best replacement for a missing tooth today is an osseointegrated implant. So let's talk a little bit about implant placement. So back in the day, um, there we go, osseointegrated implants, when they're uh, starting to be placed more, I guess frequently you'd say in the 60s, they're placed freehand. Dentists would look at a 2D X-ray and bone volume models and plan the uh, orientation. And then just like this, raise a flap, uh, drill the osteotomy with progressive drills and uh, oftentimes do mid-process x-rays to make sure you weren't impinging on associated anatomy. Um, implants then placed supracrestal and the tutor tissue is sutured either over the implant or uh, around a healing abutment. Want to talk a little bit about biology. As you guys know, osteointegration occurs because cells that become the bone are deposited on the surface of the implant by the patient's blood. And of course, damaged cells during surgery are carried away. So blood flow to the implants, which I guess seems kind of obvious, is critical to their success. Um, one of the things that we that's interesting about dental implants is they look kind of like a wood screw. And on the day we put them in, the process is kind of like screwing wood into them. But if that implant's going to stay long term, we have to get the body to attach, the cell bone cells to attach to the implant in the process of integration. So one thing we got to keep in mind is heat. Uh, studies, early studies showed that if the bone uh, heated up below 116 degrees Fahrenheit uh, during placement, we'd have widespread bony necrosis, which would lead to implant failure. Doesn't happen a lot, but we want to make sure that when we're Doing our osteotomy, we're using lots of irrigation to keep the temperature down. Then the other thing to keep in mind is blood flow. Uh, bone loss can occur for a variety of reasons, but often it occurs through basically, you might say, strangulation of the blood flow. If we don't have a millimeter and a half of at least a bone between the implant and an adjacent tooth, or three millimeters between the implant, as well as adequate bone on the buccal and lingual, then the blood can't perfuse through the bone and keep the implant healthy. Many times what we'll see is resorption of the bone until there's an adequate volume for that blood flow. You look at an implant and it's, you know, it's not that big when you're looking at it, but 
there is a lot of engineering and design that goes into this implant. When you're selecting which implant system you want to use, you want to make sure that all these are optimized for your patient's health. Obviously, the platform of the implant is critical. The design of the platform, the internal surfaces, and the screw determine how stable the restoration will be over time. You want to choose a platform that has good strength and excellent stability and the widest possible range of restorative options so that an implant is a lifetime uh, device. So you want your patient to have as many restorative options as possible. Um, you, the material of the implant is really important. Uh, it's going to receive shock loading more than a natural tooth would, so it needs to be able to withstand that force. Um, also, you want it to optimize blood flow to get good um, integration. And as you see in this slide, the thread pitch and all that's really important. Um, it's not only important to get primary stability, but also for low distribution over time. We wanna make sure that when we place our implants, we get in general, at least 35 Newton centimeters of insertion torque or a minimum uh, ISQ, a uh, score of 55. So 40 years ago, when implants were placed, the platform was usually placed equicrestal, but over the years, crestal bone loss would occur, and sometimes as much as half a millimeter a, a year. You know, just like any advanced technology back in those days, if the implant was stable over time, we're like, ah, you got to live with it. But uh, as implants have improved, patients are like, I don't know if I like seeing that gray thing above my bone. So a lot of design changes have been made. Um, implant texture, micro-threading, polishing, now some um, anodizing at the collar is really important. But what we found, interestingly, is that platform shifting, like the implant on the right, is the most important thing that we can do to eliminate crestal bone loss. Um, I think the consensus is coming that there is going to be bacterial colonization, no matter how good this fit is. And so keeping that away from the bone is preventing an inflammatory response that can lead to bone resorption. Could also be mechanical because it moves the, the majority of the force on an implant during function, as you know, is at the platform level. And so moving that force from the bone internally could also be a factor. But for one of those two reasons, or maybe a combination thereof, we're seeing that um, that using a platform switch implant is the main thing we can do to prevent that crystal bone loss. So you guys have learned a lot about this. So I just want to remind us briefly, in the maxilla, we don't have as many concerns. Uh, oftentimes, our main concern is having enough space uh, posteriorly. If a person's been missing teeth for a long time, we'll get pneumatization of the sinus as well as crestal bone loss. So it's like our maxilla is shrinking both ways. So many times you're going to have to um, do a sinus lift, either direct or indirect, to make space for your bones, uh, for, your bone, for your implants. Um, with all on X type treatments, a lot of times we want to avoid grafting. So we'll run the most posterior implants at an angle along the medial wall of the sinus. Um, the only other real common challenge in the maxilla is the maxillary bone is soft, especially the max maxilla posterior. And so sometimes it's difficult to get uh, primary stability on these implants. Uh, we could use our soft bone protocols we can choose implants that have threads that promote primary stability. But, you know, sometimes even if you get a spinner, I've talked to several oral surgeons who have said that if you get a spinner, so low insertion torque, and you put a cover screw on it and bury it, a lot of times in six months, you look at the x-rays and you'll see very, very nice bone uh, integration because the same vascularity that prevents uh, good primary stability leads to great bone growth. So, you know, sometimes in the posterior maxilla, the main thing you have to do is decide, you talk to your patient and say, hey, we're not going to put a healing abutment. We're going to do second stage surgery so that we can get that stability that you need. 
In the mandible, it's a little bit different story. Mandibular bone is usually quite dense, especially in the anterior, so it's a little bit easier to get primary stability. Uh, but there are, as you know, some more significant health concerns. One is the inferior alveolar nerve. As you guys know, the face is integrated with a nerve that goes through the, uh, through the ramus and then exits through the uh, buccal foramen. And if we traumatize that with our placement or our um, implant, the patients uh, can experience um, something like Bell's palsy, which is not a good thing. We want to make sure we avoid that. And as you know, there's also the uh, uh, lingual artery or the sublingual artery on the um, lingual side of the mandible below the mylohyoid ridge. So we want to make sure we keep our implants and our drills well away from there so that we don't traumatize that artery and cause a major health concern. Back in the day, when we first started doing implants in the 90s, you basically had to be a 30-year-old triathlete to be a candidate for an implant. Um, fortunately for most people, most of us who aren't, um, there are a lot of, there are many fewer concerns. Um, I would say there are still a few that we need to keep in mind though. Of course, a patient needs to be healthy enough for surgery and needs to be responsive to anesthesia, stuff like that. Um, but I think in talking to most uh, surgeons that I know, smoking is the main contraindication. It is very, very limiting for osseointegration. And so if you're placing implants with a smoker, you want to make sure you talk to them about the potential complications it could lead, including potential loss of the implant. Um, unmanaged diabetes or other um, metabolic disorders are a problem. Managed diabetes, not so much. I, I know some folks that have had some great even all on X results with well-managed diabetes, but if a person's blood sugar is out of control, that really needs to be under control before we're placing implants to get a good result. Uh, osteoporosis, of course, which limits bone regeneration is a major concern because we need to regenerate bone. Also, interestingly enough, bisphosphonates that are used to treat uh, osteoporosis can be a huge problem and they remain in our body for a long time. So if a patient has history of uh, bisphosphonate use, you'll wanna make sure that you are well aware of that and are feel able to deal with it or refer to someone who can. Implant diameter is really important. These days, almost every major implant manufacturer makes an implant that's three millimeters in diameter. These are not to be used just any old place. They're designed for single teeth in the mandibular, anterior and the maxillary lateral indication. So, if our bones narrow, we don't want to put an anterior type implant in a posterior loaded situation. Um, other than that, for normal size implants, uh, say three, five and larger, the weakest point is the implant to bone interface. So most likely if an implant fails, it's not going to like break in half or something like that. It'll uh, become a, uh, it'll lose its osseointegration, if you will. And in those cases, we can help out by creating more surface area. If a, if a given implant has a certain amount of newtons per square millimeter, let's say, the more square millimeters we get, the better. Also, we wanna get a nice emergence profile. So and obviously in our molar areas, we wanna use large implants and then mid-size implants for our premolars and our cuspids. And then we can sometimes use smaller implants for our laterals, even if we have the bone, just to get a nice emergent. Keep in mind that you're going to get the best prosthetic result when the implant that you place is similar in size and even shape, if possible, to the root of the tooth that you're replacing. You guys have all probably heard the dentistry truism that people buy crowns, not implants. You're going to do a ton of work and it takes a lot of skill to place an implant. And from most of your patient's perspective, they kind of don't care. The implant is a necessary evil to get the tooth that they want. Um, so we know that any implant can be placed freehand and sometimes that's the best solution. But one of the challenges with implant 
placement, as you'll find as you do more with this, is that um, your there's a variety of different placements that are possible in a given shape of bone. And so one of the advantages to doing guided surgery for your cases is that guided surgery starts out with a tooth design and then a viable implant position is found that will support that prosthetic result. So uh, in addition to the fact that you can sometimes do a flapless surgery with a, a tissue punch, which can be helpful for the patient from a trauma and healing perspective, um, you're most likely to get a good prosthetic result with a guided case because you, you're placing the implant where it needs to be to make a good prosthetic. I often will say that with guided surgical design, what we want to do is we want a plan that's surgically viable and restoratively optimal. We want to push the surgical envelope to get the best restorative result. And I think you would agree that that would be what your patients would want as well. So they get a nice tooth. Um, so that's that. So let's talk a little bit about restoring the implant. There are a few tissue level implants out there, but the vast majority of them, as you know, are placed with the platform level width or slightly below the alveolar crest. Since you've got about two and a half millimeters of tissue above the alveolar ridge, we have to do something to allow access through the tissue to the implant platform. So surgically, you'll have to decide if you want to do one stage or two stage surgery. If you have good insertion torque and general patient health, you'll probably want to do single stage surgery where you place a healing abutment like you see on the right on the uh, implant at the time of surgery and suture. The good thing about that is that the patient doesn't need any additional surgical interventions and is ready for restoration once the implant's integrated. However, there will be times where either due to patient health or insertion torque, ISQ, or something like that, you're a little bit concerned about the ability of the implant to integrate. In those situations, maybe the best thing to do is put a cover screw, which seals the platform and is level at the top of the implant, and then suture the tissue right over that. Um, those of you who do surgery will know that uh, that is the best case scenario for implant healing. Patients oftentimes don't like it as much because they're going to have to come back for one more small surgery to place a healing about that. Let's talk about provisionalization. I mean, if you think about it, your patient came to you for implant surgery because they don't want to be missing a tooth. So we should probably figure out a way to get them a tooth on the day of surgery. So as you guys know, a temporary partial or a flipper is probably the most common provisional, although maybe not the best. Um, it sits on the tissue, so it's gonna be deforming the gingiva, which we're trying to preserve, especially in the anterior region, which isn't you know, always helpful. It has a fair amount of palatal coverage, and um, it's really a, oftentimes an aesthetic solution only the person can't chew with it or whatever. Um, it's inexpensive and easy to deliver in an immediate situation, but there are some other options out there. And that's really the point of this slide is to show you some other options so you can kind of decide what's best for your patient. Um, sometimes people don't think about a unilateral flexible partial. If you have abutment teeth on either side, you can make something like this. It's going to be very retentive for the patient. And even they can chew with it if they want to. Um, and it doesn't have palatal coverage, so it can be a nice solution. Uh, Essex retainers are probably the most used after temporary partials. Um, they're nice because they don't have palatal or lingual coverage, you know, like flipper, um, but they definitely are for um, aesthetics only. If your patient chews with them or even wears them at night, they're going to rip them up and they, they better be able to make a replacement. So it's definitely very much uh, an aesthetic only. Uh, Maryland Bridges, you see them every once in a while. They're a great solution um, as long as you have space on the lingual for the wings, but it's a very expensive provisional solution. So most of the time, only in cost is no object type cases. And last but not least, I would say is a screw retain PMMA. Um, I think with both increased use of guided surgery and with increased use of digital 
time of surgery implant capture, we're going to see more and more of these. If I was a patient, that's what I would want because it gives me a real tooth on my implant day of surgery, except in the posterior maxilla offices that do these find they're very predictable. And you get the advantage of preserving soft tissue architecture and shaping the soft tissue right from day one. So it's definitely it can be a little bit more expensive, but it can be a great solution for your patients, especially if you have an intraoral scanner, you'll be able to capture easily the tissue shape that you create. So, um, so consider that for your patients. So once everything's complete, we've got to talk about the restorative process. Uh, one of the things we want to talk about is parts interchangeability or the lack thereof. Sometimes you'll see implant systems that are duplicates kind of of older systems, but you want to keep in mind that everybody has their own wrinkle on it. So it's really important to get the correct screws and the correct components that match the implant that you're using. Um, each implant system kind of has its own workflows, but we're going to kind of go through like a general workflow for the um, for the thing. The last thing to keep in mind is that an implant is a manufactured component. It's not a prepared tooth. So if a patient comes in to get an impression, you're gonna to have to have some kind of components, either analog or digital ahead of time. So make sure that you've ordered the correct components that you need and uh, have your surgeon's report handy for either yourself or your team members who do the ordering. So that way you'll know exactly the serial number, the lot number of the implant that's being placed. So that way your manufacturer can look it up and get you the exact right component especially in situations where you have some implants that are platform shifted and some are not, it's nice to be able to have that information. So you're gonna to have to remove and replace the healing abutment at each restorative appointment using the correct driver. Um, these aren't torqued to place, which is good news. So you can remove them with a hand driver. Um, the only real concern with the healing abutment is if it comes loose during integration, the tissue will sometimes grow in between the implant and the platform. You'll know this has happened either visually or when you place the impression components and tighten them, the patient will say, ow, oh, they'll feel a pinch there. If so, you have to make sure that you or your surgeon um, excise that tissue um, and Get, make sure that you have solid metal to metal contact for taking your impression. Um, there's three ways basically to take an impression. You can make an analog closed tray, an analog open tray, or an IOS with a scan body. Um, closed tray is probably the most popular, but in my opinion, it's the least accurate. The problem with a closed tray impression, as you can see here, is that once you take the impression, the impression is removed the post is left in the mouth and your laboratory has to assemble the post to the analog and push it back into the impression. Many times when you're doing that, your laboratory will choose a very skilled person to do this, but it there's a certain amount of judgment involved. And if a little bit of material gets in there, sometimes you can't tell. So it's just a process that can introduce an element of unpredictability. I'm not a huge fan of unpredictability. I would sooner know that things are gonna work every time. So sometimes I realize you have to take a closed tray because of patient opening or the like, but if you want a more consistent implant result, I would recommend open trays or ILSs. Open trays, you need to get a different coping. These are a little pictures, a little bit blurry. Sorry about that. But, um, and then you have to bore a hole in the tray so that the coping will go through. Then once this is seated and you've taken your X-ray to make sure it's fully seated, You'll fit the tray and then go ahead and use light body material around the tissue where the post emerges, maybe the contacts, fill the tray with heavy body, seat the tray over the post, and then you have to clean off the post. Once the impression sets up, you have to unscrew the screw, and then the post comes out in the impression. It seems like kind of a pain, but here's the thing. That impression coping never moves. It always stays in the same position. So there's no potential reloading errors or whatever. Your laboratory will just put an analog on the bottom there. So if you get the correct position in the impression, then you know for sure that your model is good. And that means your restoration will be good. 
iOS. iOS is really, really beneficial in implant dentistry. As you can see here, this person, this is an immediate temporization situation. But nonetheless, let's say this had, case had a custom abutment, custom healing abutment. Those are really hard to capture physically. Digitally, you just take the healing abutment out, scan the tissue before it collapses, and then put your scan post in. It really can save you a lot of time. Um, the iOS, most iOS systems are going to have a separate workflow for scanning implants. So when you set up your order, you want to make sure to let the software know that you're scanning an implant. Um, you'll usually be able to scan the soft tissue and the scan body separately. Um, when you write up the prescription, help your laboratory out by letting them know not only about the brand size and line of the implant, but also the brand of scan body that you use. Um, one other thing to keep in mind is that scan bodies have defined workflows. Like if you take an open tray impression, your laboratory can put any analog on it for a model and then do any kind of workflow that is available for that implant. With an iOS, there are limitations as to what workflows are available with given scan bodies. So when you choose your scan bodies, Try to do that in conjunction with your laboratory so that you guys can both do the workflows that work best for you. Uh, there's a lot more to that, but I think if you talk to your laboratory, you guys can come up with a good solution. So complications for single tooth implant cases. The biggest problem is, is like we've seen in this picture, when the impression coping is not fully seated in the implant. If we have the wrong size impression coping, or if it's not fully seated, the, the implant crown will be off. Most of the time it's off by either you try to seat it and it feels like it needs to rotate or it's way out of occlusion. Um, to avoid this, you have to take an X-ray every time you take an impression, you have to, because there's no way to visualize this connection any other way. This is an external hex too, with internal hex, this can be even more challenging because there's a, um, a Morse taper in here and you have to see if things are fully seated. Um, if you took an open tray or an iOS and the crown doesn't seat properly, it's an impression problem most likely. So make sure you take a new impression. If you took a closed tray, it's possible that it's a loading problem but I would still recommend taking another impression and then ask your laboratory to reload both impressions and kind of look at them from a diagnostic perspective. One other thing to keep in mind is when you're taking scans with an iOS, let's say your iOS component touches the adjacent tooth, you cannot reshape the component. If you grind on it at all, the scan's no good. So you can grind on open or closed tray impression copings, but do not reshape your iOS post. If it won't work, I mean, if it interferes, you either have to rotate it or get another component or do a physical impression. Very, very important. Uh, bites and free end cases. Obviously, if you're getting an implant, you're missing teeth. And a lot of times we'll be missing posterior teeth. A case like this, like you see on the left, if you're taking an iOS, obviously you just need to get the patient in the right bite, scan it, and everything's perfect. But if you're doing analog, your laboratory has to mount the case. And you can imagine how difficult it is to hand mount a case where all you have is a cusp for stability. So for these kind of cases, a closed tray impression coping can actually be better as much as I sometimes don't care for them. Because what you can do is seat your copings in the mouth, take an x-ray to make sure they're seated, then take a bite over the copings first, then take your impression. So that way your laboratory, you'll send those copings with your impression. And so your laboratory can, for the models, then do like this, put the bite in there and get, um, get a more stable bite. If you can't do something like this, you might want to get bite blocks ahead of time. These free end crown and bridge type implant cases, a lot of times there can be problems with the occlusion and it's just because we haven't stabilized the bite properly. So either use an iOS or really think about how am I going to help my laboratory get this piece mounted properly? So you don't have to do implants for very long before you start hearing about authentic parts. So every major implant manufacturer offers an end-to-end -end solution for their implant. In other words, 
They'll say the implant, the healing abutment, scan body, analog, compression post, final custom abutment. If the dentist and laboratory training uses all those OEM parts, that's called an authentic restoration. Most of the implant manufacturers offer a lifetime warranty on implants restored with authentic parts. But not surprisingly, these OEM parts are often not the least expensive way to restore it. Um, some labs make their own parts. Some labs use third-party parts, and it can get a little confusing. So for instance, with Densply, an Atlantis component is an authentic part, but it's third-party for everyone else. Medenica is authentic for Neodent, but third-party for everyone else, even Strauman, who owns Medenica. So it gets a little bit complicated, but you're going to want to make sure that you know what you want to do strategically with your implants and that you have a really honest conversation with your laboratory so that they understand what kind of components you want. And keep in mind all the implications of the components that you choose. So you did your impression, took a great impression, you sent it to the laboratory. What does the laboratory do with it? The first step is to make a model. The laboratory will get an analog and attach it to your impression post and either reinsert it if it's a closed tray or just attach it if it's an open tray, put a little soft tissue representation on there and then pour a stone model. Um, if it's an iOS, your lab will import your scans and then in the software, there'll be a representation of the scan body. And when that's aligned perfectly in the software, then um, a digital analog populates. Um, that's one of the examples of where scan bodies are important. Every once in a while, you'll find a scan body that does not have an analog, uh, a workflow to make an analog. So then your laboratory can't make a model, which is really frustrating. So again, make sure you talk to your laboratory about that. Last but not least, I wanna talk about pricing. Um, with us laboratories, there are a variety of different ways that implants are priced. In National Vintex, we try to do bundle pricing, which we feel like is good, but some of our competitors will offer a low price for an implant crown, but when you investigate, you find that doesn't include the abutment, doesn't include the soft tissue model, doesn't include an analog. So you're going to want to make sure that you can see a complete invoice so that you have a better idea of what you're actually paying for your implant. Um, this varies a lot from one lab to the next. And as you're thinking about your laboratory costs, this may be something important to investigate. So anyhow, your lab's got a model. So the next thing they have to decide is whether they're gonna use engaging or non-engaging components. And we used to call them hex or non-hex many years ago, but now with so many different platform shapes, engaging seems more appropriate. Uh, as you guys know, a fundamental of implant restoration is the final component cannot move at all. If there's micro movement, your best case scenario is the screw will come loose. And your worst case scenario is that the implant platform itself gets damaged and has to be replaced. So if we're doing single teeth or even single abutments under a bridge, we'll want to use an engaging component. Uh, Non-engaging components are used for bridge cases, and there are even some recent-ish studies, 2018, 2019, that are saying that, let's say this was a three-unit bridge from 13 to 15, um, oftentimes you, it might be preferable to use an engaging component on number 13 and then a non-engaging on 15, or if it's a, a three-implant bridge, one engaging and two non-engaging. So if you'd like to do that, make sure you talk to your laboratory. Most laboratories try to use non-engaging components for their bridges. You shouldn't use engaging components for a bridge because it can put stress. It's almost certain to put stress on the implants when it's seated, and that can lead to, at best, crest or bone loss, and at worst, implant failure. So once your laboratory gets the case and start working on it, uh, they may need to call you about uh, case design. Um, sometimes there's not enough interocclusal space for the restoration that you want. And so uh, may need to switch from a cement retain to a screw retain, may need to switch to a, even like in extreme cases, a screw retain gold crown where the whole restoration is one piece. Um, sometimes the screw angulation would put the screw hole coming out through the buckle, which is really difficult for you to make it look good chair side. 
So many of your laboratories would like to switch to either an angled screw access, which will require a special driver or a cement retain restoration. Um, Crown on the right looks down and you're like, why would anybody do this? The problem with this case is that you can't see the rest of them all, but this implant is placed way, way to the lingual. So to get the buccal gingival to align, this little ridge lap is needed. Obviously there's hygiene considerations with this. So you'll need to talk to your laboratory about how you guys wanna address this. You may also be able to do um, a release incision, contour the, over contour the abutment to get a better emergent. So depends on the case, but this does happen a fair amount. So be aware of it. Last but not least is pink porcelain. A lot of times if we've had tissue loss or uh, flat tissue in the anterior or whatever, people are like, oh, let's just put some pink porcelain on there. Pink porcelain, unfortunately, doesn't look exactly like gingiva. If you do a full arch of it, it can look pretty good because there's nothing to compare it to. But is, as you look at this case, this is actually a pretty good match. But if you're the patient, you have a high smile line, it's going to be pretty apparent that this is not the same as this. So pink porcelain is a solution, but it's definitely not a Band-Aid that can solve every problem. And make sure that you under-promise and over-deliver when you're talking to your patients about pink porcelain. Um, also I need to think about cement retained, screw retained, or screw mentable restoration. I would say that most people would agree that the main cause of peri-implantitis, which leads to implant failure, is cement in the sulcus. So if you have a situation like you see here, where there's a very short collar and the margin of the crown will be well below the, the gingival height, it's very difficult to clean these. So if there's any cement in there, oftentimes, and I have a slide I'll show you a little bit later that shows what happens. The implant, the cement will kill the bone around the implant and eventually can lead to implant failure. So from a implant health perspective, a screw retained crown is better. Now, it's harder to place an implant for a screw retained crown because the access hole has to come out through the occlusion or the lingual on anterior case. So sometimes that may not be an option. And if it's not, you wanna make sure that your laboratory will design the abutment. Usually you wanna design it with the mesial, lingual, and distal aspects, uh, equicrestal, and the buccal just slightly subcrestal. Um, the difference is, and you guys know this, but I, I just wanna mention it. Every implant with the exception of one that I know of is screw retained. The question is what is retained by the screw? A screw retained case, the abutment is retained by the screw. Sorry, the other way. A cement retained case, the abutment is retained by the screw and the crown's retained by cement. A screw retained case, the screw passes all the way through the crown and the abutment uh, and they're assembled in one piece in the laboratory. Screw ventable can be a good midpoint on these. Delivering a screw retained crown can be a little bit difficult because the contacts affect the seating as well as a tissue and whatever, whatever. Your laboratory will hopefully be very careful to help you out, but sometimes it can still be a little bit difficult to see those. Uh, cement retained are easy to see, but cleaning them up is very, very, very difficult, especially if you use a radio lucent cement. So what can be cool is to make a two piece like a cement retained crown with a hole in it. So then you see your abutment, take your x-ray, you don't have any interference with the contacts, and then you can adjust the contacts or whatever you need to adjust easily, just like you would a two supported crown, then you cement it. But what's cool is that you can then remove that whole assembly, clean the joint carefully, clean any cement in the sulcus, and then torque the whole thing to place and uh, fill the hole with PTFE and composite. Uh, it can take a little bit more it's got more steps, but I'd say it's more predictable and still will help you prevent pre implantitis. Uh, a few restorative concerns, splinting. Um, one thing I would say just to help your laboratories out, some of us labs don't realize how bad splinting is for hygiene. I mean, every once in a while we got to do it if we're concerned about implant stability, but in general, like this case on the upper right, we would want to make two separate can crowns. But if you put 13, 14, Dash 14 on the prescription, sometimes we're like, oh, doctor wants to explain because we sometimes don't realize how bad that is for hygiene. So um, 
it might be helpful to say 13 comma 14 individual crowns or something like that to make sure you do that. Like we talked about, um, if you have a small implant in the posterior or if you have a lingually placed implant in the anterior, sometimes a ridge lap or a cantilever is needed just to seal the tissue. And then um, another concern can be dark triangles, like in a case like this, where you can see that capillary form has been lost, the implant is fairly small, positioned well, but it doesn't have, um, got to figure out what to do with this. Sometimes your laboratory can help you by filling in the contour on the lingual and still getting a nice spatial contour, but you'll definitely want to talk about it. Almost every restoration, I would say every restoration has some kind of abutment. If we define the abutment as the piece that connects to the platform of the implant. Uh, there's several different kinds. We can say this is a tie base abutment. It's very, very small. And it basically is a platform, or sorry, an interface with just a little bit of retention that, you, that uh, uh, usually a zirconia crown is cemented to. They're only used with screw retained. Um, and they can work quite well. They're better to use in the laboratory. They're difficult to use in the mouth because a lot of times the tissue height is here and getting good access for the cementing is not that good. Years ago, stock abutments were more popular. And uh, a stock abutment, there may be one human being in the world that they fit, but they're not really designed for a given patient. So as you can see, they don't have as much support either for the tissue or for the uh, contacts. Usually the margin is far subgingival. Um, it just isn't as optimal. These days, most laboratories can get custom abutments for the same price as a stock abutment. And a custom abutment is a CAD CAM designed abutment that fits well for that particular patient. Uh, most of the time, I would recommend using, um, if you're doing a cement retained, or even sometimes with a screw retained, you can do a, custom abutment and then do a crown with a hole in it and the laboratory will cement it for you and give you a nice result. One of the things about custom abutment design is deciding on tissue pressure. Most custom abutment manufacturers will let your laboratory specify how much pressure is, is desired. And kind of the default is a little pressure at the crest of the ridge and adaptation down here. But make sure you talk to your laboratory about what you want. Um, this kind of design allows for a wider emergence, which usually helps close dark triangles and um, get a more optimal shape, but it will require potentially a little anesthesia to seat and the patient will feel, you'll see some blanching with these cases. Every once in a while, you'll have a case where the implant is very, very small and the crown is very large. It can be resolved two ways. One is with ridge laps in the proximal, which are difficult for the patient to keep clean. Or the other thing is that the abutment can be deliberately oversized. And then um, when you deliver it, you make a release incision with your scalpel, cut all the way down to the bone at an angle uh, on the lingual aspect um, from the sulcus out usually to the adjacent tooth. They'll allow the tissue to spread buccal lingually. And most of the time you don't have to suture that, it'll heal up nicely, but it'll allow you to basically get many of the benefits of a custom uh, tissue former when you don't have one. Uh, you're probably not gonna wanna do it on every case, but keep in mind that it's a tool that can be in your toolbox. You also have to decide about what abutment material you'd like to use. Um, now I better get going here. You can get titanium, which is a great material. It's strong, it's uh, malleable a little bit, so it can absorb occlusal force without breaking. Uh, and it can be anodized, if you like. Um, some of these coatings promote tissue health, but also um, prevents discoloration of thinner material. You can also use zirconia. Zirconia with a titanium interface can be just as sturdy as a titanium abutment. Zirconia with the zirconia interface sometimes can have breakage, especially when they're being delivered. Deliver them very carefully. If the interface breaks, it's very difficult to fix in the mouth. But oftentimes, zirconia are used mostly in anterior aesthetic situations. Um, with implants, keep in mind that the load on an implant crown, because there's no periodontal ligaments for give, is going to be higher. So we want to make sure that we choose high-strength materials either zirconia 
uh, PFM or a gold crown if you want, or Emacs. I definitely wouldn't go any material less strong than Emacs just because you know that the load on there is going to be greater. Also, with an Emacs, you'll want to make sure that you control the shine through of the abutment. Um, when you go to deliver the abutment, I realize I'm running low on time here. You want to re remove the healing abutment again, check for any tissue overgrowth, and then seat the abutment, take an x-ray, make sure it's down. Um, the patient shouldn't feel pain in the dental implant. You guys probably know this, but if they feel any pain actually in the implant, send them back to the surgeon because that's probably indicative of implant failure. Keep in mind that most of your laboratories will give you some kind of indicator where the buckle is, maybe a dot, maybe a groove, something like that. Kind of talk so that you understand that it'll help you put them in. Um, every once in a while, you'll get a screw that's long enough to grab before the platform's engaged and you can tighten the screw with the implant not fully seated. So again, kind of rotate it and push so you can feel it engage then tighten it down and also take your x-ray to make sure that's good. Again, screw retained crowns. The one difficult part is the fit to the tissue and the contacts affects the seating. So make sure that everything's adjusted properly. You may need to take more than one x-ray. Uh, again, take your radiographic verification. And then it's very important to torque your abutments properly. Um, this, These numbers seem like they're cast in concrete, but some manufacturers update them. So it's best to kind of reach out to your implant manufacturer or your rep and have and say, hey, what's the number? To make sure you torque it properly, you'll use a torque wrench with the appropriate tip on it. And then, um, of course, you pull on this. And as this moves, when you hit the number you're looking for, then you know the screw is tight enough so it won't come loose. Very important to use a torque wrench when you're delivering final run. So if you're Doing a screw retain, uh, it's best to fill the screw hole with PTFE tape and composite. Uh, with cement retain, you've got to make sure you figure out some way to clean it up. This is an example of an implant that failed due to peri-implantitis, and you can see how the cement contributed to that problem. Uh, if your crown, if your implant crown doesn't fit, we talked about that previously, but it's probably going to be due to impression copings not seating. Of course, you can always go back to the model, check it. Doesn't seat on the model. <laughs> Talk to us in the lab and say, you know what? If you can make the crown seat on the model, I'd appreciate it. That's on us. And occasionally there could be a loading error with a closed tray impression. But if it's an open tray or iOS, it doesn't seat. You got to take a new scan. Something didn't go right with the original scan. Handmade custom healing abutments. These are a pain in the behind to do, but if you make them, you'll be getting so much better tissue response and you can really preserve some of that anterior gingival architecture. Um, today, there are some new abutments that you can get that are machined from your, uh, you take a scan day of surgery and then this contour is idealized and it looks all pretty and it's fairly straightforward to make. I think that this is something that's really underutilized that could be a great tool in many practices. Let's talk about All On X real quick. All On X is a full arch screw retained restoration or a full arch implant retained restoration. Um, generally, patients who do this treatment have six to eight failing teeth per arch. So because their primary concern is getting back teeth, we're focused on getting them a provisional the day of surgery. Um, there are usually gonna be a few appointments before the day of surgery to get an immediate denture and maybe something like this that could be used for implant guidance. And then on the day of surgery, we'll go ahead and place the implants and then convert the denture. The converting a denture is difficult, so make sure you have good support for that or you feel comfortable with it. Um, once the implants have healed, uh, there are a variety of different methods for this, but the traditional method is that you take an open tray impression at the MUA level, and then you'll get back from the lab a bite block and a verification jig. You'll go ahead and use those. Lab will do a setup. 
you make sure that the tooth position and the gingival adaptation looks good on that setup. Be picky because your lab's trying to copy that for the final. Then you'll get a, a titanium bar that fits on the MUAs with the setup over it uh, to tr try in one more time. And then the last appointment will be the delivery. Again, a huge topic. I just wanted to give you guys an overview of that. So that's all I have today. Thank you very much for attending. I hope that was uh, helpful for you and that you have a good day.